Welcome along tonight. My name is Alan Bilton, and it's my very great privilege to welcome you to the latest in a series of literary salons in association with the Cultural Institute uh, of Swansea University uh, and Hono Press. Uh, tonight, I'm delighted to say we're going to be speaking with Jane Fraser about her first novel, uh, Advent, which appears on screen uh, now. So if you do have any questions for Jane, please feel free to type them into the Q&A facility at the bottom of your screen on Zoom. And then uh, after Jane and I have had a little conversation, uh, I'll be happy to read any of those out to Jane and put those questions to her. If you have any problems along the line, if you can't hear us or some horrible technical glitch has happened, then please uh, type into chat. Uh, and let us know uh, that something's gone horribly wrong. But all questions, if you possibly could, if you have got a question for Jane, please put them into uh, Q&A uh, and I'll get to them uh, in the second half of uh, this hour. Uh, so I'm delighted to, uh, to be joined tonight by Jane Fraser. Jane is lucky enough to live and to work uh, on the Gower Peninsula. Uh, she lives in a beautiful, uh, albeit haunted house, uh, out on the Gower, uh, but you know, you can't have everything. Uh, and you know, I've, I've eaten some lovely cakes in this house, so I can vouch for its beauty. I'm not sure I can vouch for its haunted uh, status. Her first collection of short stories, uh, The Southwesterlies, was published by Salt in 2019. Uh, and amongst her many uh, achievements, she was a finalist in the Manchester Fiction Prize. Uh, she was a prize winner. Uh, for the Fish Memoir Prize, uh, and was also a Hay Festival uh, writer at work in both 2018 and 2019. Uh, she's also uh, a graduate of uh, Swansea University's Creative Writing Program. Uh, she uh, took both an MA uh, and a PhD with us. Indeed, for her PhD, I was her internal examiner, which is a, a particularly gruesome uh, image. Uh, but she loved the Viva so much that she's decided to relive it all again tonight uh, for your entertainment. Um, tonight, though, we're going to be talking uh, not about the Southwest Police, but about Advent, uh, her first novel, uh, set in the Gower in 1904. Uh, it's just been published by Hono, which is uh, the world's, uh, the UK's, sorry, longest standing uh, independent women's press. And hopefully, uh, Jane is on the other end of the line. Jane, are you there? Thanks for the invite, Alan, and I'm really looking forward to chatting with you this evening. And um, I hope it's not going to be as grilling as it was at the Viva. Oh, it's it's the harsher, uh, you know. It's uh, <laughs> Obviously, you just wanted to relive that experience. You thought, I need to have that one more time. But this time in public, with, with anyone being able to listen in. <laughs> so I thought we'd open with... I think writers, there's always two questions that writers hate to get asked. Uh, and one of them is, are you the central character? Is that central character based on you? And the second question that writers hate to be asked is, where do you get your ideas from? Because that's okay. always a very tricky one to answer. But okay. in the case of where do you get the idea for this novel from, you've got a very specific source and a very specific family link to the material. I have indeed. The Novel had its genesis actually when I was on the creative writing course at, in Swansea University, when we had to write the opening section of a novel. I had no idea how to write the opening section of a novel. I'd never approached long fiction before. And I thought, what on earth am I going to write about? And then I found a photograph, a sepia photograph, but tatty around the edges. And there was a young dark haired woman staring back at me, looking straight at me, almost inviting me to tell a story. And it was my great aunt, Ellen Thomas. Obviously I never met her in my life, um, but my mother was still alive. Um, she was obviously my mother's aunt and she left a go of farm when she was just 19 and sailed on a steamship on the Campania to Ellis Island with just 10 pounds in her purse and set out for a new life. 
So I thought, gosh, that's an interesting story. But I didn't know anything else about her other than she sailed twice. She sailed once in 1899 and she sailed once in 1904. So I thought, oh, why did she come home? She'd obviously come home in, in the meantime. So we had no idea. My family had no idea about that. My mother had some harebrained ideas that um, she'd come home um, to talk her because she had um, an alcoholic father and she needed to to try and and save him but I didn't want to really know the truth of her, of her story but there was just a gap there between between the two sailings I thought oh that might make a uh, a good story so although Ellen Thomas is based on a real character on my great aunt the, the story is completely fictional apart from the, the farm where Ellen Thomas was born and brought up, which was um, the, fam the family farm in my, mother, in my mother's family, where her father and his twin brother were born as well, which were the, are the younger brothers of Ellen Thomas in this novel. So that was the, the genesis for the story. Um, no. Did you did you ever think of yourself as a historical novelist, or would, would you like to be a historical novelist? Goodness gracious, no! I'm not an historian, um, and I'm definitely I didn't want this to be um, a history lesson. In fact, I was I had a good terror when I was writing it in case I um, had an historical inaccuracy in it. Um, oh, pe people will be saying that into the Q and A terrifying. tonight. You know, like one of these films that you see on the TV when you suddenly see something from another period. Then I thought, oh my goodness me, um, this is not going to be right. Um, so it, there are no the only histor actual historical figure that features in the novel is that of Evan Roberts. Um, uh, you know, a formant in the. Welsh religious revival and that was just fortuitous because when I looked at the date 1904 it was just like a gift so that I thought my goodness me when she comes home she's just at the time of the Welsh religious revival and although it's not a story about the Welsh religious revival obviously that was going to be in the backdrop just as Brexit I suppose is in the backdrop of of, of things that have been going on in our lives this last few years, the polarization of families, the arguments, the politics of it all. Um, so she was coming home against the background of the Welsh religious revival. So no, um, I'm not an historian. In fact, I didn't set out to write historical fiction. I just wanted to write this, the story of this woman. And then I got more and more fascinated with a with a journey and, and what she would you know the independence of that girl at such a, a young age to do that and then to come home um so that's what fascinated me so then yeah. I had to go and do the historical research um I mean a great deal of research has obviously got into it there's a great deal you know it, it feels we we trust you and we believe you that a, a Gower farm would feel that way we trust and believe you that uh, uh, about mining, about the revival. How did you go about doing all the, the research and how then do you make it live and breathe and work in a story? OK, um, well, Gower is my place. I've lived here for 47 years. It's also the place of my mother. She was born and brought up here. But I also, um, even though you might find this surprise, and I was not actually around in 1904, but I did connect with people who were around in 1904. I remember my grandfather, I talked to my grandfather. So I had a lot of oral history coming down the generations and especially through my mother. So there was that. Um, I also turned to ship's manifests to get the accuracy there. Um, we did a lot of walking as I always do for Walk My Place. I think we walked along the old railway lines, long gone now, um, that used to run from Gowerton. If people are familiar with Swansea, Gowerton's a, a suburb of Swansea, one hugely industrialised, on then to Pencloth, again, which is now known for its um, shellfish, but had a big industrial past, as did the whole of the North Gower Peninsula. Um, like I was thinking about it the other day, really, in that the, the, the similarity with the, with the southwesterlies that I wrote of the stories is that both 
both the short fiction and this novel advent tell of a of a different face to Gower, a hidden Gower. So whereas the Southwesterlies showed the other side of a, of a much vaunted tourism product, and that we still see today, is that I think Advent opens up a Gower that is long gone, that industrial past where the ruins of, of you know, the mine workings and the, the ports and the, the tin plate works and the lime kilns and the lime quarryings. So I've, I've tried to bring that as a backdrop into the book and they obviously would have affected my my characters here the 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 twins who lived on the farm jack and george um who would have been forced well one of them my, my grandfather in fact did mine uh, go out and into one of the mines that went under the lacher estuary on north gower i have a photograph actually that was taken a little later at the colliery called new lynch which went out under the lacher estuary so i knew i knew i've seen him the photograph of my grandfather so i know he worked in that environment um i knew that his twin brother originally drove a haulage lorry and dive call it diversified from the farm into into haulage so there was some first-hand experience there and the rest was just made up um obviously the religious revival i was not au fait with that as much as i perhaps i should have been um we did a lot of walking over to lucha we went to the i philip and i my husband and i went to um the to see the chapel mariah chapel where he went and he he, he preached um so I, I do like to feel my way around my place i think the place for me comes first um i was talking to another writer the other day rebecca rebecca john and um she could imagine a place without having to put her feet on the ground and walk through it but for me i have to have to feel it from the ground up then my place i have to walk it i have to know it um, and then I can make, try and make my characters function in that in that space. So I hope it has an authentic feel to it. I, I aim to be to try and make it as authentic as I can. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you're, you're one of the great sort of Welsh writers of place and that sense of, of rootedness and both in a, in a very lyrical sense. I mean, there are some beautiful passages about the changing seasons and the flora and the fauna. We, we tend to think of the Gower as a very beautiful location. But you're right, you're also very good writing about rain, mud, cold weather. And you're right, but the surprise here to me, with my English ignorance about all of this, it's just how industrialized the landscape was mm -hmm. uh, and, and how that transforms the natural world and just how dirty and grubby and, and kind of used up the land was here. Um, and that, that comes through very, very strikingly. I think both of your, your um, portrayals of farming life, which whilst there are moments of beauty, also stress the monotony, the hard work, the, the tough physical labor, but also the industrial gower, which really in the 21st century, it's hard to even imagine it was ever there. I think it was a hard slog and it is a hard slog, you know, I and um, I think what I wanted to try and create in there is the is the rhythms and the, and also the, the slog of of life really how hard life was in that um turn of the century we're talking 1904 farming envir environment here and the and with the with the poverty uh, with the industrial background as well so yes and i i think my first hand experience of the farming there's some quite brutal farming it's not a pretty farming scenes in in a lot of the books there and my house here the garden here abuts uh a field where there are where are the usually sheep there, and sometimes it's not a pretty sight, really. And uh, um, it's not <laughs> it's not a pastoral image of not a little a pastoral little image. White yeah. and I, I just wanted to to try and create that. I suppose that's my own limited. I'm not a farmer, but it's my own limited perspective on farming that I've tried to to place on on that. I did know the actual farmhouse where I've set the set advent um i used to go in it as a child so there was a lot 
a lot of memories that seeped seep through them my mother did put me right on this because i've actually put tiles on the floor in the in the farmhouse she tells me that in the in that time it didn't even have tiles on the on the floor it was just an earth floor so um there are some historical inaccuracies there you know okay. there are, uh, hope there, yeah there's uh, another historical inaccuracy as well really an architectural inaccuracy before anyone says is that um in the village of clan and i is the church is dedicated to two saints which figures a lot in advent the church is dedicated to saint ridian and saint Ethelred. i've given it a lich gate with my writer's prerogative there it hasn't oh. actually got one so before anyone catch it, tell, catches me out, I know it hasn't got a lich gate, but I wanted to do it for, for effect, so... Uh, I can only imagine the Q&A is just a buzz with angry Gower residents now. No we'll gate. have to turn to that later on. But um, hopefully I'm not, I'm not just bringing this upon you, but do you perhaps have a, a reading from the novel uh, that captures some sense of, uh, uh, of the Gower and Gower life? I was thinking of maybe the second of the two readings we were talking about, the one with the, uh, it's the, the lambing, isn't it? This one, yes, is is from further on in the book. It's on, um, on a March day when Ellen, the central character, goes out to check on the lambs with her brother, her brother Jack. So I think I have, this is, I quite like this extra because um, I think it reflects both the exterior and the interior of Ellen's perspective on it. With a climb to the higher fields, the breeze is stronger, yet carries a gentle whisper of warmth and things to come. Ellen takes off her hat, stuffs it into her coat pocket, unpins her hair and shakes it free, letting the wind run through it. She turns her face to the sun and lets it permeate her skin, seep into her cold winter bones. This is what spring should mean, she thinks. Renewal, this is revival. Jack unties the baling cord that is secure in the rickety old gate into their field adjacent to the moor. He heaves it up with his right shoulder to take its weight, lifts it so that it opens despite its rusty broken hinges. Everything round here is flaking and rusted or encrusted with salt, thinks Ellen. Struggling to keep intact through a winter of wet and an incessant wind off the sea. She takes a look at Jack as if to prove a point to herself. He's young now, but he'll bend like the trees around here soon enough, bow in the middle to the will of the southwesterlies, like the stunted blackthorn that stoops at an angle of 45 degrees around the pip perimeter of the field. There's an inevit inevitability about it that makes her shiver despite the rays of sunlight. Under the blackthorn along the edges of the field, most of the new lambs are suckling, but in the middle there's a heap of fleece stained red strewn across the pasture and a magpie beaking what's left of a carcass, bobbing its head and slurping out the entrails. Nearby, a stillborn lamb, its eyes pecked out, sockets hollow. Pity that, says Jack, as he hefts the weight of the dead ewe and lamb to the side. Dig a pit now. Can't expect anything else, really. Not this early. But still, the others are doing all right, says Ellen, wondering whether Jack's life would have panned out differently if he'd been born with a cowl over his face, whether he'd have some lack of free choice as the elder son on a farm. She watches a young lamb jerk to its feet and latch onto its mother. She thinks about Hannah and the baby coming any day soon. She thinks about herself. Her periods are coming every month now. She's sick and tired of death in this place that feels like it's in its death throes too. When he's finished the digging, they tramp the field, checking the ewes that are still pregnant. There are still about 20 ready to drop, heavy in the girth, shit spattered, worm ridden, and most limping with foot rot and oozing with mange. Jail, Jack wrenches a few free from the bramble and they run off, trailing the green and prickly foliage that's attached to their fleeces. It never ceases to amaze Ellen how lambs can change into such stupid, ugly creatures. It's here on the top fields that she knows she made the right decision in leaving for America, that life in this place will never be for her, not anymore. Wow, thank you very much. Uh, no one can accuse you of over-sentimentalising Rural life, I think it's best. Apologies for anyone eating 
whilst they were having the man to the foot trot. <laughs> That's right. I like, I like the gross slurping inside the as well. The slurp in the entrails, very appetising. Yeah. Very nice. And absolutely, and sort of, sort of, I guess the matter of factness of, of rural life, about life and death and bodily functions and fluids and just the stuff that you, you deal with and the idea that a farm can also be a, a kind of a prison or a trap and you get sucked into the mud and trapped uh, in that one location, which is one of the central themes uh, of the book. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, just steal Michelle's question from the Q&A, uh, if, I, if I can, uh, and ask you about the transition from writing short stories and uh, again you've been tremendously successful as a short story writer the southwest has had some wonderful reviews it's a beautiful book you published a great deal of short stories mm -hmm. how did it feel turning from that to the novel did it feel like you were using the same muscles or did it feel like a very different uh, beast indeed some same and some different um it was way out of my comfort zone um i i, I I, I'm a lover of the short story form. I love what it does in a, in a, in a few thousand words. It, you know, it's a glimpse of life. And this. So this was a whole new challenge. But I did take some of the um, some of the things from the short story form, I think, to the novel. I mean, the biggest similarity, it's short for a novel. So I've been told it's 60,000 words. And, you know, that's that's quite short. Um, I think in the in the making of the chapters, I sometimes saw them as complete little short stories that we cut, we cut in, we cut in at a certain time and we cut out. Um, and I and I brought that. I don't think there's a lot of. They say that the the short story is um, like an arrow in flight. There's there's not a lot of fat on it. It's quite lithe. Um, I don't think there's a lot of fat in this novel. A lot of. Um, Themes that go that, that go sideways. I think it's quite a direct uh, narrative and a, and, a, and a direct plot. Obviously, there are so many differences. Is that um, in the short stories I tended to write, I'd probably have limited characters, um, um, limited theme, just one theme, um, and a, a, a not a very complicated plot line. Well, this isn't very complicated, but obviously I've got far more characters in this in this book. But to be honest, I was going to have more characters, but in terms of in a, in in the farming family, I perhaps there would have been more at, at family in in 1904. But I felt in the doing of this novel that I couldn't give them a relevant all those characters. Um, a realistic storyline. I didn't have anything to go with their story, so I kept it to to the to the f the five children that were. So a limited number of characters. Um, it was very different. Um, I don't know if you know Alan. A lot of I, a lot of people I know. I keep I keep um, going on about the writer Claire Keegan, um, the Irish writer Claire Keegan. She's a wonderful short story writer. And she's got a novel coming out this year. She gave me a lovely analogy of, of the short story and said, the short story happens after, happens after what happens happens. That's when the short story starts. Whereas I think the novel starts before what happens happens. Yeah, so it has a very different shape. Um, it, I saw it in a diagram once that it, in a short story, you're drilling down, going into deep water. So you've got a shape like this, yes? So you go in like this. Whereas in the in the novel, it's opening out, I think, like this. Yeah. Okay. Another similarity um, I think I took from the from the short story. I really don't like endings that are really, really tied up. Um, someone said, told me once that if fiction is a mirror of life. Then the only real ending is death, and that doesn't really, <laughs> that doesn't really bode. You know, I can't It'd have. Like Jane, come on. I can't. You know, you can't have every novel ending in death. So what I wanted to do in the novel, and this was a new experience for me, it's not a tied up ending. But I hope, and what I wanted to do, was to try and engage the reader for them to know my character, my characters, and to get to know them and to perhaps work out how they might 
what might have happened to them after the, that final pa page was shut. It's not that oblique, but when that final page is closed, they think, oh, I really want this to happen because they behaved like this in the novel. And I know that Richard guy in that novel, and he's likely to do this. And she's quite a manipulative woman, that Ellen Thomas, and I think she was going to get this out of it. So I think this might happen at the end of the novel. So You do, yeah. you do resolve the narrative in the very last line of your book, which is quite... I a I can't, give that, I can't give that away. I mean, no, 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 definitely not. And then, and the other thing, then I think, as a writer for me, is that it's the concentration span and the the whole time and concentration span that's involved over time in writing a novel. When I write a short story, I like to be in the sort of I sort of have an idea for a short story and I try to write a first draft in one sitting so that I stay with the mood and the tone and the and the momentum of of that story whereas you can't do that with, with something of 60 to 100 you've got to go in back and I'm not a plotter so that I'd be it, it was a big learning experience for me to sort of to come back and to pick up where I left on so that I would try try to have that melding of voice and that it wouldn't be disjointed as as I went forward does that make sense yeah absolutely yeah uh, I mean it's yeah, you've also got to like characters of you, really. That you know, um, I really quite like this Ellen that I made in the end. She's deeply flawed, yeah, she's gritty, yes, yeah, she's determined, um, she's a little bit of a control freak, but underneath, I think she's been damaged and hurt, and she's a little insecure. and. I thought, yes, you're not perfect. And I thought, yes, I, I quite like you, really. I can I can stay with you for a long time. I think it was about, it took me about over a year because I wrote this, I, I know, you know, but I don't know if we've got, if we've got an audience there, is that writing is not my full-time job, you know, that, is, that I've got a day job, which is my full-time job. Um, and this was written pre-lockdown. Um, so it was written when I had time. So. I had to revisit it and go back and you get completely sucked in and absorbed into the world that you you create to that novel. I can remember one occasion which was really funny, which was a, a Sunday afternoon and I'd got, it was the scene in year when Ellen is going to the religious revival meeting and my husband interrupted me and I said, Go away. I said, can't you just see I'm on my way to a religious revival meeting? I was there with her. So yeah, I you've got to, it does suck you in, I think, in um for a longer time and in over a you've got to like those characters and to want to live with them, I I think. Is that yeah, right? I mean it, it's yeah. it's a very it's a very immersive novel and you feel like you're there and you feel like you're with those characters, and you would very much feel with the passing of the seasons, and that seems very important to it so a key event happens at Christmas and then you've got the new year and then you've got spring coming and the changing of a season again structures it and gives a shape and a form and a sense of progression and change and we know at the end of all of this that Ellen's going to have to make a big choice mm -hmm. and that is the, the dramatic crux I guess of the novel is mm -hmm. she going to stay on the gower stay as part of this rural community or is she going to go back to America and that emotional struggle because she's going to gain something and lose something in both scenarios mm. seems to be why the novel is so is so rich and so affecting because we care just like she cares well you know obviously she was being pulled in so many directions really there was a new life that was there that she'd been there for two years before she came home she knew that she could have a future there but also she, she had a love of a home and of a family um and i think it's those those ideas of expectation and duty that um i was trying to to balance up with her especially as a woman with the limitations that she's that she felt as a woman on the farm what was her role going to be and i also touched on it um with the with the love interest in this because i think sometimes we think 
the man also had that thing you know there was a, also the expectation of duty that fell on the love interest in this as the eldest son on a farm as well there was such an expectation to continue and to carry on with tradition and things like that so she's really breaking the mold which she's starting to break the mold she's had an awakening and um she's starting to find her feet and yeah she believes that life is not really fair and she's not prepared to take perhaps what or the the norm or the expectation is for her as um as a, as a 21 year old woman but as you're saying the rhythms i wanted to get that rhythms you were talking about the short story again as well the duration of this is very short of this novel i think it's not a you know it's not a huge family saga it just it's, it cuts in in December 1904 and it cuts out in, Ju in June um, 1905. So it's just six months. And I think, but I, I think it's enough to show the repetition and the rhythms of the farm in life and, and the seasons. That's why also I named it Advent. Um, you know, titles can be a really big stumbling block. But I wanted, although she does come home in December and it's Advent in the religious sense in the in the run up to Christmas, I wanted it to be more Advent with a lowercase a really in the non-religious sense of it as well, about the coming of events of notable things, as you said, as of the seasons of of marriages, of, of deaths, of 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 the religious revival. So I hope the the title um yes we've got a question a question from nantia came through in the chat right. about the title advent and the importance of christmas in it so advent is is expectation an expectation of change and waiting for something to happen mm -hmm. but i guess ellen isn't a isn't a passive character it, she's the opposite she may although the the roles the possible roles for women are quite contained uh in this world she in narrative terms she's the one who makes the decisions she's the one who comes up with a plan and she's ultimately the one who is going to decide should i stay should i go and again that's very interesting for that period i think she's taking beginning to take control of the reins as be, she's beginning to take control of her own uh life as a female but she's also a schemer i think you know she really wants um if she decides to go back which she might or she might not to go back to the state i think she wants to leave her mark and the family in a better position um because of her um because of her doing than before she came so she is she, yes and that is she perhaps she's got too much control you know she is a little bit of a control freak i think you know i don't know where she gets that from or who she's based, who she's based on but yes um she's I, not a traditional heroine from a kind of a, a more romanticized historical novel is she she's she's very prickly and feisty and skeptical and cantankerous and you're right some of her actions could be seen as slightly manipulative well, uh, yes i think there's there's one um i think we've got this right there's one line in the book when she recalls what her father's told her is that when she was a child she was a little schemer because she pre she suffers from headaches and obviously i think she's used this as um to her benefit at some time that she got out of going to schools so i think she is a schemer yeah to so that she will position herself um as being in control because a life to date um wh when she's at this point in a day as the in her life as the novel unfolds is that she's been a victim let's put it a victim is a strong way of putting it but she's been out of control yes and mm. she's felt that people are controlling her and she does she she doesn't want that to happen she also well, her, like her mother has had very little say in her life she's kind of tied to tied in the apron tied to the to the kitchen it's a servant role really isn't it and as oh. you can see that's that's potentially the future someone said to me the other day it was a um you shouldn't look at reviews but it was a review i, I read about um the book is that it's some someone said that if her mother um eleanor took her pinafore off 
then perhaps a whole being would collapse. It was the only sort of thing that would that was keeping her going there, a role, a role there. And she wasn't speaking out against it. But yet um, in the book, um, for those who obviously haven't read it, is that we've got three generations of women living under the same roof at Mount Pleasant Farm. We've got Elizabeth, who, the grandmother who sits in the in the corner, who doesn't say much, but uh, sees everything and puts her two penny worth when she's in. And really, she's egging Ellen on to be to stir it up a bit. And I quite liked I quite liked her. And then you've, we've got the Eleanor in the middle, um, who was sort of tutting and muttering about um, a daughter, Ellen, who's come back from America with her newfangled ways um, about, um, about the mines and about church and about religion. And so I, I really liked the tension and those three, those three generations of women under the same roof. And um, what I quite enjoyed writing, and I don't know whether this is something that is common to most people is the relationship that Ellen has with the grandmother, which bypasses the mother. Um, my children had that with my grandmother. I seem to be having it with my my granddaughters as well. It's almost like this um, this furtive relationship that the, <laughs> the mother the mother's um, on the outside there. So um, I hope. Yeah, that I you... like the grandmother, and I like yeah. she's quite naughty, and she she's kind of a, you're right. She's always egging her on to. to well, yeah, she's going look out for it. freedom yeah. and choose for yourself and don't get trapped here. And yeah, she's gritty, and I think yes, it's, you know, just because she was ninety years of age and um, she was born in in the nineteenth century, she did she must have had these feelings and that things are unfair and unjust, and she wanted to see a, a granddaughter to stand up for things and um, and push on like that you know I can um this thing of independence you, know, you think it's just I can remember um my mother-in-law um saying to me um just about her early married life how much she hated ironing in a shirt and polishing the shoes for a husband to go for a drink on a Friday night, you know, and that wasn't fair. And I suppose all these things that you hear, you know, I, I've tried to put them in into those uh, those characters, this real sense of fairness and this desire to be a little bit more independent, to carve out a future that was on on her terms. Excuse me. So, so given given all these themes, uh, was it nice a nice fit with Hono Press as a as the UK's oldest independent press to, that to I, represent and portray the role of women. I was delighted that Hono um, invested in me and in and in this story, really, because I think it's the best home that Advent could could have had. You know, they their vision um, is to promote Welsh women writers in the past, in the in the future, in the present, and to give voice to stories that are that are set in Wales really so and yes I think I've it, it ticked all the right boxes for that and I'm really proud and honoured to be to be published by Hono you know such a long-standing women's press um, and I think yes this story is not just written by a woman living in Wales um, or living in Gower that views Gower as a cosmetic backdrop I'm hope I'm hoping that the book shows that it's written by a woman who knows Gower from the feet up, um, knows the, D the DNA and that the story is not just set in Gower, but really made in Gower. So I think Hono is is perfect for it. Uh, I hope they think if I hope they think it leads to. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure they do. So the final question from me before we move over to questions from the audience. So please feel free to keep on typing your questions uh, into the Q&A for Jane. Uh, and the final question is a traditional one. So what next? Are you, are you staying in 1904? And no. what's, what's the next? The next Is it going to be short stories? Is it going to be novel? What's next from the House of Fraser? <laughs> They've gone, they've gone bust, haven't they? Are they going bust? <laughs> um, I'm not staying in 1904. I think there's a lot, there's so much interest, so much interesting things happening in the present. So I've got another collection of short fiction that is um 
is ready, ready to go. That's it's called connective tissue. Um, and that's with my lovely agent, Gaia Banks, and she's hopefully she'll be able to, to place that soon. But my work in progress is um, ooh, it's a it's a hybrid novel and it's set in the present tense. Um, sorry, set in 2018 and it's told by a 60 something year old female character um, who is trying to unpick her life as the UK unpicks itself from Europe um, and Brexit. Um, it's a hybrid in that I've got um, the ongoing narrative is so just over 14 days in the alphabet streets of southwest London, um, where the 64 year old woman meets a much younger woman so i'm trying to explore the idea of sisterhood female rage again yeah but against a different backdrop um but interspersed with this uh, is backstory of this woman and that's told in lots of voices it's told in first second and third person so it's it's quite outside my comfort zone i've getting through there i've had time in in lockdown to to write that so i'm and i quite like the the title the alphabet streets because this woman's life is nothing but in alphabetical order so uh that's what i've got that's what i've Very got nice well so that's what i thought sounds got. hugely ambitious and exciting so <laughs> we're, we're looking forward to it so, it's nice to, uh, new, nice to have new stuff isn't it it's not Yes, I love writing about Gower and it's my place and it's my home, but this time I'm writing about another place. I, in fact, that came first as well. The Alphabet Streets came first in London because I know my way around that part of southwest London. And so my characters are playing out in a, in a different background this time. So we'll see how that goes. Well, well we are, our advanced order is already waiting uh, in a second. So let me turn to very swiftly to the chat and the question, the Q&A uh, questions. The first one comes from uh, David Lloyd, who writes, as an older writer myself, I find the publishing industry tends to focus on younger writers, typically in their 20s and 30s. What advice would Jane give to those of us who are a bit older to overcome perceived barriers to publication? Okay. Um, well, my only experience is two books, and so it's based on very, very limited experience. And I know what David is, is saying is that you can't fail to see um, competitions, perhaps that ask for 30 under 30 or 40 under 40. So perhaps we should go for 70 under 70. I, I, I don't know, but all I can say, it's not been a barrier to me. Salt who published me, a hono, Who's published me? I've never, I've never had to fill a questionnaire in or how old I was or, or um, that. I see. I think you've got to see yourself. I see myself as a young writer and a new writer in terms of my voice is new and hasn't been out there before. Um, so I say you've just got to, just got to believe in what you've got to say and, and trust that what you've got to say. Is, re is relevant and I think it is I think there's a really underrepresentation of perhaps older characters in books and obviously older older appearing writers but um you can only do what you can do and I can you can point to Kit Duval or uh, Elizabeth Stroud there's a there's a lot of people who are debuting at um at, at, at an older age um but all, saying that I tend to think that we need to think of it that there's not the right age to do something but the right time to do something and i think this an older writer it was was the right time for me i don't think i had anything much to say um when i was much younger and i think it was having the confidence after going on the creative writing course um and having the confidence to, for the first time in my life to say, yeah, I'm going to have a go at this. And this is this is what I need to say. I want my voice to be heard and I want the voices of my characters to be heard as well and and go from there. And you, you've got to just believe that, yeah, that it's the right time for you and not the right age. I think we've got to just be confident. Well, thank you. As, as older people. <laughs> OK, thank you. No, cheers. Thank you, Jane. 
Uh, okay, question from... Anyway, I know David Lloyd, he's only 70. <laughs> no, whippersnapper. Whippersnapper. Yeah, give him a cue for the jab, David, come on. Uh, okay, uh, Kath Barton uh, has written in. Uh, she praises how beautifully you evoke the sense of place in the book and the realities of life. Was there anything that you did find difficult to evoke? Was there anything that was challenging to imagine or empathize with or picture? Was there anything that, that was difficult to capture as a writer? For, for me, in this historical novel, it wasn't so much the place. As I said, I think I had the threads connecting me through my mother back to that time and the history. It wasn't, it, 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 for me, it was the pace of information how information passed because there were things when things happened in the novel in, nine, in my in advent in 1904 I wanted to say oh I'll just ring someone up I'll just text somebody and let them know that um, so and so has died or we're going to change the arrangements and really it was the pace that I had to slow everything down and just to think well how would that information how would I have let that person outside my community know um, that this X had happened or this had happened, you know, whether it would be through writing a postcard or, or that. It, it, that, was the, that was the most difficult thing I had to do, was to slow that down. Yeah. Um, and it was things like the actual, for Kath's benefit there, um, like after this, after Ellen Thomas comes home from America after traveling on a steam on a steamship for a week and then taking a sooty train from Liverpool down, she wants a bath, you know. And I wanted, I wanted to have a bath scene because of the intimacy of that scene with three women on the plot. And I was thinking, well, what are the practicalities of getting the bath, boiling the hot water, uh, these sort of uh, these sort of actual concrete functional things that uh, I really, really found difficult. Okay. Not, well, yeah. link to that, Ellie's, ask, uh, Ellie's asking, can you escape beautifully yourself? Or is the wonderful description of Ellen in chapter 13 all from your imagination? So what are, was... you, are you a championship skater, Jane? <laughs> I know, I, uh, I can tell you, I did do roller... Um, roller skate disco dancing once, which I think is becoming back in um, in lockdown. I think it's a craze. I did that, but my one and only experience on ice skate was at the Cardiff ice rink. No, I'm not an ice skater, and that was purely imagined. The I just it was the the, the skate scene takes place on um, a, play, a, a landmark in Gower, the Gower Peninsula called Broad Pool, which is on a, um, a small pool um, on the spine of Gower called Kevin Bryn. And only once in my lifetime have I seen that frozen. Um, and that was 1963. My father insists it was 1947, and I, had to t I have to tell him that I wasn't actually around in 1947, but he insists it was, but there we go. Um, and I can remember going on there, not skating, but just slippery around there. So I just thought it would be a wonderful thing for Ellen to go skating on this. So I had to imagine that. I had to imagine putting on the skates myself. It was something obviously I would like to have done, that gliding on the ice like a champion, showing all, <laughs> showing all, showing all, showing all, the, all the farmers, the boys around that you were as strong and as, um, and as fleet as any of them. Yeah. I think there's still time to take it up. I think, I think you know, <laughs> Winter Olympics, there's still trying. I don't think I've got the muscles, I haven't got the muscles anymore. But I just wanted okay. that scene, I think as well, to show um, a physicality really, is that she's a strong girl. As she says earlier, she could have made, she could have made a farmer's wife. She'd have made a good farmer as well, you know. She's, she's, mu she's muscly and she also really likes, um, she likes the feel of the physicality and the sexuality of her, of her own body really. And I think that imagined scene there hopefully conveys that, the, the, the wonder that she's got in the, the strength of her own female body. Okay, absolutely. Uh, let me ask some, some very creative writing style questions. Oh, so one from Hillary. You use the present tense throughout. Mm. How did it feel writing in a present tense? And that is the things that it can do, things that it can't do. Why, why the present tense? 
I'm a lover of the present tense. I'm also I love writing in the in the you in the you line. Yes, and I know the pre I've all, I love a short story in the written in the present tense because I think it gives you that immediacy of time, and I feel as if I'm actually with there with the action and time is passing from that point yes in fiction from that point um i didn't know how it would work in a novel over a over a long text whether whether the reader would would stand the writing in the present tense it's sixty thousand words but I, yeah i can sort of it's my favorite mo favorite tense for writing because i actually feel i'm there and yeah, fiction is a, is a temporal art, isn't it? Fiction, time moves the story on, and when the when the action is placed in the past, I find myself often distanced from it to bring it there. But if I can start off in in the present, I feel I can move with the action myself and with the action of the characters. That's the best way I can put it. Is that does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. But I know some people don't like it at all. Do they? They don't like. Um, the present I've never written in the present tense. Yeah. Ever. Um, no. They don't like it over long periods of time. I don't know, but it's not to everyone's taste, but six months in the present tense are so do for me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay. Question from Joshua. Did you edit the novel as you as you went along, or did you write a first draft and then start revising it? What's okay. the best way to go about things? Um the first part of it had a degree of editing because I did it in the creative writing module, 7,000 words of it, which are the towards the beginning of it. Yes. Yeah. But in terms of process, it, it, it's a book of two halves, this really, because I edited the first as I went along. And then I had a huge desire. I thought, oh, I, you know, I'm going to sort this out at the end of it. I just wanted to write through to the end and edit at the edit at the end so in this case I did it I did the two things yeah in the in the work the current work in progress my aim is to write right through and edit at the end to get that story on the page like you say with all its mess so when it when it comes out it's messy it's not perfect it's raw and then the editing will come later I think when I see it as a whole I find it slows me down um in the story you've got the impetus that you want to get to the end of the story uh so that's what i'm that's what i'm going to but in reference to this i did two things so that's not really a very good answer really is it no, it's no, no it's very good <laughs> it's, a, it's, no, it's, really it, it's both on it's both you've got to do both i think that's fair to say I mean, in question terms of, mary, sorry sorry question for mary jane about recently you've been writing haiku uh poetry H has this um signaled a new direction in your writing or has it changed your writing at all or what's the what effect does writing haiku have on on your your prose writing i haven't written a haiku for 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 quite a while but i am a a, a lover of the haiban form yeah which is the mix of prose and the little the, the little haiku in the middle. I'm a failed poet. When I came to do the creative writing, I th I, it was poetry that was my main my main love. I I didn't, and I turned out that I couldn't do poetry, but I did love the haiku, the haiku form, that short 17 syllable, three lines, concrete image, yeah? Um, and I do like, I think, I think, I hope that I've created in there lots of visual imagery, yeah, so that you can see those little concrete images there that perhaps linger along in the mind. If that's what a haiku does, it's um, a unit of meaning, a, a thing that lives long in the mind. So I, that's the only that's the only connection I can make with the ha with the haiku on its on the on its own, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you. A uh, question from Naomi. Um, given the relationship between the generations of women, was it a deliberate choice to give them similar names to link yes. them? Eleanor, yes. Ellen. Yes. And I know it's not to everyone's choice because I've, again, you shouldn't look at reviews, but some people say that they find this confusing. I mean, there were a lot of Cathy's in Wuthering Heights, but, you know, we won't go there. Um, 
from my I wanted it to be authentic in terms of the name the naming so I took that those names actually from the farm the farming names of my family my mother's name is Eleanor a middle name is Elizabeth she's named after her both grandmothers yes so I wanted to keep the E there and the family names a lot of farming families did did this um it's a family name Ellen my daughter's name is Ellen as well the midwife who delivered my daughter's name was Ellen the lost village near um Llanridian and Gower is Llan Ellen the church of Ellen so I wanted this name that sort of came out came out of the out of the out of the land at that time and out of the farming out of the farming stock then really um so they all started with ease yes so i'd be interested if i don't know does it work for you did you find it confusing i don't know no i i thought it was fine my mum's also called eleanor so um right no i i thought i i don't yeah i think that they're looking for picky things if they say they get confused you know, the characters are crystal clear i think who they are in their roles. this tradition of family names you know yeah. passing on passing on and um yeah they, they're still passing on in my fa in my family now so i yeah i did it based on my desire for authenticity of what i knew about naming and and tradition of tradition of naming sure well perhaps the final question tonight and unless i've missed anybody out in which case many uh apologies uh comes from nadia uh in russia uh and she's asking you about do you think it's possible to tell the stories of our grandparents and their parents to a younger generation and was that important to you that family connection and the idea that part of the writer's role is to pass on the law the wisdom the learning the lives of previous generations that's interesting i think it is really it's a, to show this connection with ans with with ancestors uh, and and pass the lives uh, the, the stories the stories on um there are these invisible threads aren't there between women the mothers and I didn't set up between mothers and grandmothers. Um, in a way, I'm hoping to do with it with my grandchildren now. I'm hoping that they perhaps one day will remember something about me. And my mother is still alive and they're very interested to know what's happening with my mother's life and when she was small and what was her life. It's this, these, these invisible threads, I think, that connect us through the generations that that you want to tell a story yeah so yeah it's not my story it's not complete it's not historical fact i mean my stories fill the space in people's life they're my version of that woman my that is my version of that woman as i wanted to be not as the woman who actually ended up in real life married to someone in the states with three children that was the real ellen thomas this is my fictional thomas but i um so I think it's a person it's a personal choice perhaps isn't it but for all, whether it's authenticity but i think we we've got a, an inkling to, to know about our ancestors i think perhaps ancestry yeah ancestry.com wouldn't be so popular if, <laughs> if if it wasn't was it right one one final question has snuck in which i'll i will ask because it comes from david britton so of creative Thank writing so, so i'll get a big trouble if i don't ask this question obviously tomorrow there'll be an angry email uh, and he says about you were very big part uh, at Swansea sorry, University. I that. I, sorry, I missed oh, sorry, that. Sorry, I missed that. Sorry, you were a very big part of the creative writing community at Swansea University. Do you miss that? Do you miss that? That kind of the support and the other, being surrounded by other PhD writers? Is it harder sort of ploughing a lonely field on your own? <laughs> Well, writing is a very solitary, you've got to be pretty odd, I think, to go into write and write on your own. My MA and my PhD at Swansea University was the most wonderful experience because not only did it give me the discipline to write, um, you know, for modules and towards ends, that, so that's important as a writer but it gave me the toolkit as well to write, but it also, the wonderful setup that there, that there was this huge spirit of cooperation 
between other other writers at at Swansea University with the workshops, um, and it was a very fertile, a very fertile atmosphere to be in of sharing work and critiquing work, learning off different people of different ages of different cultures and it was a it wasn't a competitive environment at all it was a it was a really cooperative sh shared experience and i think the phd was as well i think that is quite unique in in a lot of universities is that most a lot of uh, phd students i gather are in in isolation with just having their they are meeting with it with, with their tutor whereas the the setup at Swansea University was that there were monthly workshops with all the PhDs could get together as well and so in that um feeling of like that you were writing in isolation and and just chat over shared problems shared triumphs shared successes everything I just think it's it's got a, a really wonderful setup there and I wouldn't well I would never have I would never have written if I hadn't seen and been accepted um, on the MA uh, at Swansea. So it's been the, what you call it, the catalyst and the gateway into my um, late writing. <laughs> well, that's very, very kind of you to say, James. Well, it, and it, was it, was a, it, was, it was a golden age whilst you were there. I, you think, I think it's important that it doesn't end, actually, when you you when you finish is that what i found is that i've kept in touch with lots and lots of the the ma and the, and the phd students um with with events such i guess you see the name popping up there uh, we are on twitter support we help each other out so i think that, that the roots that you put down there they've not ended for me and i know i can always ask someone's opinion on this or there's someone's set of eyes another set of eyes and things so it's yeah it's a very enriching and very warm environment to to, to study creative writer yeah well well thank you very much for those kind words right. so i guess our time here is about uh, at a close so let me suggest you race to your keyboard but you're there already uh, and order a copy uh, from Hono's uh, website uh, of Jane's fine book. Uh, also to say that uh, if you do have the time, we would appreciate it if you filled in the event survey form, which is also there's a link there on chat about how you found uh, this evening's chat. Uh, also to say that uh, you can also find details of upcoming events, uh, including uh, Dr. Daryl Leeworthy and John Gower talking about the prolific Welsh screenwriter Elaine Morgan, which is going to be the next in the literary salon season. Otherwise, it only remains to me to thank uh, Elaine and Matt from the Cultural Institute, as ever. Uh, thank you all for all your questions uh, and for attending tonight. And of course, mainly thanks to Jane for such a, a wonderful reading uh, and a, a wonderful uh, answers uh and it's always lovely to see you jane and it's a beautiful beautiful novel thank you alan it's thank you for the invite thank you all thank you for tuning in farewell see you at the next salon bye bye